Hey, it's Straw Hat Sam here, and I want to introduce you to the Vulture, which is my new FPV frame that I'm calling a mini lifter because it's both a mini quad and a cine lifter. In this video, I'm going to be talking about all of my design decisions behind creating this frame. And if you like to nerd out about this kind of stuff, stick around. All right, talking about this drone from a more general perspective, I chose inverted motors in order to accommodate a wide variety of camera payloads, such as GoPro, Sony RX02 with a C-mount lens, or even a cinema camera like the Blackmagic Pocket 4K. The inverted motors accomplish multiple things. For one, it reduces the chance of getting props in view of the camera, whether it's a GoPro or a larger cinema camera. It also allows clearance for wide cameras like the Pocket 4K. It allows you to use multiple battery options, either lengthwise or toilet tank style. And you do get a little bit of a thrust and efficiency boost because the arms are no longer in the thrust column of the propeller. And lastly, since the motors are inverted, the propellers don't have to be super widely spaced, and this allows the whole frame layout to be more of a stretch X style. This is still technically a squashed X. This dimension is actually less than this dimension, but this dimension is still long enough to achieve good stability in the pitch axis, which is really important for carrying heavy payloads so that the motors have good authority in order to maintain attitude in windy or turbulent conditions. An obvious problem with inverted motors though is that the propeller is much closer to the ground. And that's why I went for a vertical plate design. This allows for an extra increase in distance without having to use super long standoffs. In addition, vertical carbon plates seem to work really well with my camera mount design, which I'll talk about later. And then this is not so much an issue with inverted motors per se, but I do find that if you're running your props out instead of in, you'll be flinging grass and dirt directly into your electronic stack. And that's why I went through the effort of coming up with these easily removable side shrouds in order to protect your stack from debris to reduce the chance of getting short circuits or other issues with your electronics. To keep the drone balanced as it's sitting on its takeoff surface, uh, I have these landing legs, which are actually a separate part from the rest of the drone. Because they're sticking out so far from the chassis, they're a bit more vulnerable in crashes, so they are easily replaceable, and I do sell spares on my website. And I'm sure you've noticed they have a dual function. They also serve as a uh, mounting point for your antennas for your VTX. But you can also use SMA antennas for a long range build using these 3D prints that come with the kit. They just mount onto these uh, rear screws if you choose to have them be extended. And then you can plug in your SMA pigtail from the bottom and then have your antennas sticking out the top like that. Okay, let's talk about the camera mount now because I'm <laughs> it's the most exciting feature of this drone actually. Uh, it was a little bit of an accident how I came up with it and a bit of an evolution too. The original design of this drone actually had a rigid mount for the camera and it was meant for the Sony ARC-02, but I found that using six and seven inch props, the rigid mount was not adequate for getting rid of the jello in order to have perfectly smooth footage. I was only able to achieve this with five inch propellers. But since five inch propellers just wasn't enough to uh, carry the Sony ARC-02 with a lot of power like I wanted. Um, I wanted to come up with some kind of soft mounting solution. This is just a PLA prototype, but I used beta gels in order to have like a soft mount solution. And this did work at eliminating the vibrations in the footage when using six inch props, but with seven inch, it didn't quite, you know, cut it. And also I used Sony Catalyst Brows stabilization and it would cause uh, artificial jello to reappear even if you couldn't see the jello in the original footage. So the soft gels were adequate, but they weren't up to my standards. And it was around this time that I started thinking about how cool it would be to be able to also use larger cameras on the mount, because I was quite impressed with how rigid this little mechanism was, and I thought, oh, I bet you it can take some more. And then I started messing with using uh, 3D printed rigid inserts, and at first, uh, that was terrible for <laughs> causing jello with the RX-02. It was no better than using a rigid mount. But then I, by accident, uh, actually left a little bit of a gap and made the prints a little too loose, such that the mount had some slop like this. Um, 
it's not designed to have any slop in the vertical direction. As I'm tugging and pushing on it, it should have no uh, slop in this direction. But it is meant to glide back and forth side to side. And I found that with this particular camera, it just completely killed the vibrations and the footage was absolutely smooth. Even after running it through Sony Catalyst Browse, there was no signs of artificial jello whatsoever. And what made this such a great discovery is that it's great that this mechanism also works for cinema cameras, but I definitely do recommend using uh, battery straps in this configuration, running them underneath the arms for extra security in case of a crash. And when using battery straps to compress the camera onto the drone, these soft beta gels would get easily damaged. So by having this mount be rigid in one direction, but absolutely loose in the other direction, you kind of get the best of both worlds. And I think this works in this case because I'm using vertical side plates. As the vibrations are coming into these motors, these arms have a lot of stiffness in the up-down direction. So most of the vibration coming into the frame is going to be in the XY plane. And these vertical uh, side braces are gonna be extremely rigid in the vertical plane, like the, uh, I don't know, called the Z, Y axis. But they are going to oscillate in this direction as the vibrations are coming in. So what these vertical plates are doing is kind of filtering and directing the vibrations in one particular axis. And that axis just so happens to be the axis in which there's no mechanical rigidity uh, thanks to the slider bushings of the camera mount. Now, about this quick release mechanism, uh, it's 3D printed out of PETG, which I found is a suitable material because it has a little bit of flex and it can undergo a lot of uh, mounting cycles, even in cold weather. I've thrown this thing into the freezer and then clipped it on multiple times just to see if I could get it to fracture and under the cold conditions and it held up just fine. A benefit of using a 3D printed clip like this is the STLs are free to download online on GrabCAD and you can print as many as you like for as many cameras as you want. So the way this thing works is it has a three point mounting mechanism. First it clips into the rear standoff, then it clips into the uh, second one and the last one about the same time. And this little lever allows you to pull up so that it releases on the front standoff and then the rear standoff holds on to it still because it's in a different direction. So that's where you twist the camera a little bit in order to release it. The reason why these hooks are pointing in different directions is because this rear hook is really key for preventing camera ejections and crashes because that's one of the first things that you think about with a quick release system for a camera is like, okay, what's going to happen if you get into a crash? So this rear hook allows for the camera to stay in place even when it's tumbling around and rotating in the pitch axis rapidly. Uh, that rear standoff is going to maintain hold of the clip because the clip is facing the opposite direction. And then meanwhile, the front clips are meant to keep the camera secured against the surface of the carbon fiber fangs. And notice how there's a little bit of curvature here. They're not exactly straight. That's actually super important because it allows for four points of contact on the bottom of the camera. You see, when it's a flat, straight piece of carbon, there's really only two points of contact and you get a little bit of bobbling in flight, which can lead to uh, pitch payload oscillations when tuning. So this subtle amount of curvature actually made a huge difference, especially when using larger cinema cameras. Propeller choice was one of the most important aspects of this drone frame design. Six inch is what I settled on, and this is a bit unorthodox. Most people choose five or seven inch. Let me explain my reasoning. With five inch, because this camera is meant for heavier payloads, such as like cameras like this, five inch is just not powerful enough. It works really great at, in terms of getting smooth footage and maintaining stability in turbulent flight because of the high RPMs, but the power just isn't there. And I wanted something that was really powerful and fun to fly. With a seven inch setup, on the other hand, I had plenty of thrust and power, but the issue was that 
No matter how much I tuned, even in windy conditions, there would be a little bit of bobbling. And that's because for lighter payloads like the GoPro, the propellers are not spinning at a very high RPM and they can't react in time to these uh, very sudden gusts of wind that can throw the drone off its attitude. But 6-inch, on the other hand, it spun at a high enough RPM that the drone was able to maintain stability in flight, even in windy conditions, and it had a bit more thrust to play with to do fun acro and things like that. But the issue with 6-inch is that vibrations on the 6-inch propeller were just as much as on the 7-inch. I was still getting jello on the Sony RX-02 camera with 6-inch, much the same as with 7-inch with the rigid mounting configuration that is. That's why it was really important for me to eliminate all vibrations so that I could use six and seven inch propellers. Another benefit of using six inch props is it's just small enough to make it acceptable for using a clip-on propeller guards that I developed. Uh, these guys, they just press on like this and press in using this 3D print. And this provides uh, a pretty sturdy and rugged bumper that won't cause damage to people or property. <laughs> and the footprint isn't so huge that you can't fit it through a doorway. Another benefit of the vertical side plates is for the rear portion of the drone, which is used for mounting the battery, you have the option of both using toilet tank style or longitudinal. Um, for toilet tank style, you run the battery strap over this front standoff, and usually this second standoff works pretty well. This is great for running uh, GoPros or Sony Arc Zero Two because it reduces the moment of inertia along the pitch axis, which allows the drone to get smoother footage. And this long rail here is really convenient for mounting the battery longitudinally, running the straps through these two slots right here. This does a great job of balancing out the uh, camera if you're using a larger uh, Pocket 4K or Komodo, things like that. But uh, you definitely want to match the battery size to the camera payload, both in terms of amp draw and center of gravity. And the vertical rear plates provide a convenient mounting point for your Immortal T antenna, which lots of people use in the cinema industry. And then I've added all these slots and stuff for you to have convenient mounting of your uh, regulators if you choose to use something like that or mounting your receiver. One question you might have is, how did you connect vertical plates to a horizontal carbon fiber plate? The way I did it is using, um, I guess, this finger system where the vertical and horizontal carbon plates interlock together like this. And then for the top portion, I use these 3D prints that run around the standoffs in order to lock the vertical plate to the horizontal plate with an M3 screw. And then for the bottom, these joists keep the uh, front plates and the rear plates from splitting apart during a crash. One of the uh, benefits of the interlocking carbon system that I discovered is it actually provides some vibration damping. This was something I learned from uh, working on the Viper, which is still a work in progress Cine lifter frame. It's uh, a prop guard indoor lifter X8 for heavier payloads around people and things like that. With that kind of design, I used a lot of these interlocking joints and they did a really good job of dampening the vibrations, even despite using really thin pieces of carbon fiber that are going to tend to have more vibration resonance. In the spirit of versatility, I also have these slots down here. I do have a 3D print that allows you to mount cameras on the bottom of the drone for either top-down shots or reverse when you're uh, in front of a car or motorcycle or something like that. This I would really only recommend for like a GoPro because these bottom mounts are rigid mounts. They may work with a Sony RX-02, but I haven't tested that yet. And these prints, since they're kind of rare, are not included in the kit, but they're free to download on GrabCAD. In addition, these battery strap slots are provided so that if you want to carry something else, uh, like a 360 camera or whatever, you have that option. In addition, there's a quarter inch hole conveniently placed here, which you can use to screw in some kind of uh, selfie stick or whatever, provided that you remove the landing legs first. Another curious aspect of this drone frame design is the eye shape layout of the arms. So normally when you have a uh, H style, the front and rear pairs are connected together and you have a little bit of a uh, torso here. 
Instead, I've turned that 90 degrees, and this allows the front and rear portions of the drone to come closer together, which lowers the moment of inertia on the pitch axis. Just like the pigeon and the puffin frames and the mamba, I do have some silicone rubber that is sandwiched between the arms that's clamped together during the assembly process, which really dampens the vibration and resonance in the carbon fiber. This rubber between the arms is the same as on the top plate and the battery rails. And I made this decision because when the rear battery is cantilevered off the back in order to compensate for the weight in the front, due to larger camera payloads, you don't want any kind of squishiness because if you have like a squishy substance like UmaGrip, um, unfortunately the battery will oscillate back and forth and you'll have lots of troubles with tuning. By having a more flat and rigid battery pad surface, the battery has no opportunity for payload oscillation and is rock solid. Now, as far as components, uh, this drone is really best used with 30 by 30 ESCs that are 55 amps and higher rated. And uh, as far as the VTX is concerned, it's really not meant for the full-size DJI air units, the original ones. You can fit it if you want, but you won't be able to use the side shrouds. Um, instead, I recommend the Cadex Vista unit, the DJI 03, HD0, or even the Walk Snail Avatar system will all be compatible with this drone thanks to this carbon fiber VTX mount, which just adapts 30 by 30 footprint to either 20 by 20 or a 25.5 by 25.5 diamond pattern. So this drone was actually originally designed to be an 8S uh, mini quad and I wanted something that was ultra powerful and could go really really fast. So if you want to you can run this on 8S uh, but I preferred not to because it was just a hassle running two 4S batteries and plus tuning was a little bit more difficult and there's a less selection of motor choices. Um, speaking of motors though, uh, I'm using the Hyperlite 2807.5 1722 kV. 1700 kV is around the right speed for these uh, 6 inch props, as long as the stator diameter is at least 28 millimeters. I chose the 2807.5 because the extra mass of the motor allows for more torque for handling larger payloads like Komodo or Blackmagic Pocket 4K. But I do plan to experiment with motors like the Xnova 2806.5 1700 kV, which could be quite comparable to the Hyperlites because they generally tend to be a bit of a higher quality motor and a smaller form factor. The original name for this drone was actually called Speedwagon <laughs> because I wanted something that was super versatile but had a lot of power. And man, when you fly this thing with just a GoPro payload, it's just an absolute rocket. And it's exactly what I wanted. And this is perfectly achievable with 6S, which I found to be definitely adequate in terms of power because it's enough to throw a GoPro around like it's nothing, but it's also enough to rip around larger payloads like the cinema cameras. Because this is a speed demon, um, I'm allowing a lot of camera up tilt, up to 50 degrees, for those of you that want to chase airplanes and things like that. So I think I covered all of the most important aspects of the Vulture design, but if you have further questions, feel free to ask me in the comments below. And I also have a frame assembly and a components installation video. You can also check out my rotor builds page for the Vulture, which lists uh, all my recommended components, including motors, propellers, electronics, VTX, things like that. And I also have some flight footage on my YouTube channel. Just type in Vulture in my playlists and you can find everything there.